This is lecture 27 of ECE 2305. And we are two lectures away from our wonderful voyage, if you will, through the communication system and network. So when you guys started with me, um, which was seven weeks ago, minus two days, uh, you, you started on this journey where we went into understanding what is a communication system? Why do we need to communicate? You know, so nice, high level, uh, fluffy stuff, if you will. And then we looked at regulatory aspects a little bit. We understood a little bit about the laws and, um, and sort of the economic drivers behind communications technology. We looked at hardware. And then we progressively, through up to four exper experiences and 13 quizzes, the last of which we had today, what we did is we went all the way through every layer of a communication system. We are now at the top layer of that system. So right now, let's, let's go back to that really cool cool diagram that I love drawing. So you all know what I'm talking about. So let's see it. And it is, oh my dear, it's a cloud. OK, so here's the cloud. Happy cloud. And happy cloud here um, you know, has computers connected to it, right? Just like every happy cloud, right? And here's another one. And so what we saw is this is our communication network. Right? This is computer A, computer B, and computer C. And what happens is this computer, like each computer, as we saw before, has a network access layer. Right? This is our, remember, this is our protocol architecture. Protocol architecture. Right? So network access layer. IP layer for all of these guys. We then looked at the transport layer for all these guys, right? So we just finished that. Transport layer TCP. And now, through various ports, right, this one's going to have a lot, what ends up happening is we're going to look at the application layer. So this is really where the human, OK? So let's say that's me. Uh, let me do that correctly. So bushy hair, um, crazy eyes, very big grin. Um, after moving, changing 16 tires on cars, maybe a bit bigger arms. <laughs> so what happens? <laughs> Very sore arms. So what happens is the application layer is where the human interfaces with the computer. So this is where, if you send an email, this is where I'm interfacing with the network, right? So do I speak IP addresses? No. Like beep, 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 beep. It's almost like you know, from Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, right? That imperial probe on the ice planet of Hoth, like No, no, I don't speak. I don't speak IP. No. I speak, oh, yes, um, you know, and then say, oh, hi, Jen. Let's go for a walk at noon today. It's really nice. OK. You know, we do this, like, you know, sort of like uh, email exchange. And then I go around campus. I'm sweating, of course. And she's like, oh, isn't it beautiful? I say, yes, except I have a class at 3. You know, so I'm really nervous. I'm getting pumped. So then what happens is we saw how there's an application. And that application talks to a port. And then through that port, it goes through the, uh, to the transport layer. The transport layer takes that data, data, puts it into segments, packages those segments. The segments then go to the IP layer. We get IP datagrams. Those IP datagrams are then packaged and in the network access layers. We make frames. We send them over. Like, you know, of course, we turn it into raw electromagnetic energy. And then we send it over to the network. And then the network somehow magically through various routers and gateways and servers and DNS and DHCP, sends it to other, to destination computers on the network. It's great. So all of you, and it's remarkable, because I have to say, I even learned something from this class. Like, you know, every time you teach a class, it kind of opens your eyes to various things every time. Like, you know, I taught for five times. I taught the grad level probability course many, many moons ago. And then I kind of lost. And, you know, after a while, if you teach something too many times, you kind of lose, like, the excitement. But every time, it's like, wow, I never, 
what happens if I try to teach random processes this way? Here, you know, I, had a, I have a, like, you know, and hopefully all of you have now a greater appreciation of every layer of a communication system, of how data is broken down and then encapsulated and protected, and there's these different layers that have different functions, all the way from connecting processes and applications and machines and interfaces with the outside world and to other computers on the network. So right now, we are at the topmost layer, right? And we have a variety of applications. I believe in one of our first few quizzes, uh, we talked about uh, hosts and ports and and then it's like, you know, we had port numbers assigned and they corresponded to specific applications. And if you go, like, let's say, yeah, I know, I, I hate this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, suppose we go to Wikipedia. <gasps> that's, not, that's not peer reviewed. It's okay. Let's, let's do it anyway. So we go to Google, 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 Google. And what happens is, let's say we go to uh, TCP ports, ports. I know, I hate this too, but, but I mean this, like at the very least, even though it might not be thoroughly reviewed and it's by some schmo that may or may not know their, uh, their material, what it does do is at least tells you about like, you know, a little bit gives some insight, but you can always look at a peer reviewed source for actual, you know, hard facts. But what happens is all these ports, uh, it, for these, uh, these numbers correspond to different ports that correspond to specific applications that are connecting to those ports, to the TCP, to the transport layer, and then ultimately trickle all the way down to the network access layer and over the network. And so what we're going to be looking at, you know, here's like a variety of different ports, but what we're going to be looking at is the following. We're going to be looking at in this lecture at H H T uh, HTTP. So we're going to be looking at web browsing. Okay. So, and then later on, tomorrow, we're going to be looking at DNS. Okay? So we're going to look at the gory details behind HTTP. So even for your, uh, which one is it? No, not socket programming. Your third hands-on experiment, right? You used Wireshark, and you're looking for essentially, OK, here's traffic. It belongs to HTTP or some other application. So in the case of the HTTP, it was kind of cooked. It was like, visit this website in order to prompt traffic in order to monitor it via Wireshark. So let's look at the architecture behind HTTP. You have a server. You have this web server. Have any, has anybody set up a web server, Apache or anything like that? OK, so you know what I mean. So you can set up a web server. And then at the same time, like what happens is this server is supposed to distribute some sort of content to one or more possible clients over a network. Okay? So what happens is the client communicates with the server, uh, might be intermittently connected. Uh, there might be a, 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 a dynamic IP address. Usually you want something static, right? Because imagine if your server has like a changing IP address and you can't track it, or there's no way of your client accessing it, it's kind of silly, right? And then finally, um, what you want is something that like, you know, can give content out, and there's a certain protocol that's associated with it. So this is based on the HTTP protocol. And so the web page consists of objects and could be a variety of things. So HTML, anybody programmed in HTML before? HTML, OK, yay. I remember I was so impressed in 1995. It's like, oh, I made my own website. You know, and it's like in raw HTML and yeah, OK. And things have progressed since then. I still do like the raw coding in HTML rather than uh, you know, use an editor or anything like that. And it shows, unfortunately. My website looks like from 1995. So then there's JPEGs, and you have applets, you have audio. So what happens is your website, right? let's say the content that the HTTP protocol delivers can be images, can be like some sort of text formatting, could be video, could be Java. It could be a number of items, objects, that you're downloading and displaying on your client. right? And then what happens is that server right, can be accessed by something like this, a URL. In this case, this is kind of phony. There is no ECE 2305 GIF. If it is, it would be like, I'm trying to think, what would be a mascot for 2305? I don't know. But what happens is we usually start off with, you know, in our web browser, we say HTTP colon slash slash. And then you have the URL, which references that 
location on that server, right? In this case, I'm going to try and access information that's in the form of GIF, right? So it's an image format. So the HTTP indicates the protocol. And you might say, well, gee whiz, why do I care? Well, because you can say HTTP, you can say HTTPS, which is secure, right? You can also, in other cases, you can say things like FTP, but that's no longer HTTP, that's an FTP protocol. That's a fire transfer protocol. Um, and then you have your host, which is www.wpi.edu. Again, um, that's in the case of like, you know, the main WPI website. Um, but you do have other sites on campus. Like for instance, if you go to www.wireless.wpi.edu, um, that actually will redirect you to the department's WordPress site. Same thing if you actually, uh, for instance, if you go to www.sdr-boston.org, um, that's something that I actually set up through GoDaddy or whatever. You want something really cool, and it will redirect to a WordPress site that's run by the EC department. Okay? And then the last part, this guy here provides a path name to a specific file or object or content that you want to download because it's for information or whatever, right? So, HTTP, what does it stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And so that is our application layer protocol for the web. And so we have, again, this client-server model, and the client browses the content and receives it, and the server dishes it out. It gives that content to the client. And this totally is within the, uh, the protocol layer and usually uses port 80. So if we use, if we open this guy up, okay, so what happens is we have port 80, okay, it's in our diagram. So you would have that HTTP client or HTTP server and you go through port 80 and you progress all the way through the network and then access that application at the other end. Okay? And so what ends up happening is the server will accept that connection from the client and then uh, the exchange will begin until such time that once you get that information, then that connection is closed. Right? So there are different types of connections with HTTP. So one is called non-persistent HTTP where what happens is one object only is sent over that connection, all right? So what ends up happening is every, so if let's say you had a non-persistent HTTP and you had multiple objects, you would have to reestablish a connection every time to get an additional object, additional object, additional object. Persistent, on the other hand, means that you can get a continuum of a variety of different objects from that same one connection. You don't have to reestablish it every time, okay? And so what happens is usually the HTTP connection is persistent. So that would be really annoying. Imagine you open up a, w a website and then all of a sudden, like, you know, where's the images? Where's the stuff? Or, or, or anything of that nature. Every time you wanted to get some object from a website, you have to reestablish a connection. That would be quite painful, right? So by default, we usually set the HTTP to be persistent. Okay. So here's another example. So let's say we look at non-persistent HTTP. So let's say here's the steps if, let's say, we wanted to ac access this website. Uh, just, just a quick note, none of these websites are legit. Like, n none of them exist. Or if they do, I would be really surprised. Like, you know, but for the most part, like, you know, this guy does not exist. Like, WPI marketing would be really upset. So in fact, yeah, so, so what happens is, let's suppose you have non-persistent. What would happen? So step one, your HTTP client would make, would establish a TCP connection with the server and um, on port 80, okay? So unless it's otherwise indicated, all of this would be handled on port 80, right? Now, the server at that, uh, you know, at that host that's waiting for that connection will accept it and notify the client. It's like, okay, thank you very much, connection established. Now, what happens is the HTTP client now sends a request message containing the URL through that TCP connection socket. Okay, now everyone knows about sockets. And uh, the message indicates that the client wants this specific object. In this case, it's an HTML file. And so now, it gets that file, okay? So in step four, it receives a request, it forms a response, contains the object, sends it, and then closes the connection. 
And therefore, and then the client receives it and displays it on the screen. So what happens is in this step by step, it really goes through the process of, okay, I'm accessing this guy. So what happens? So what ends up happening? So I try and initiate the uh, connection. I send a request. So in this guy, so I accept the connection. Then, I, then what happens is the client says, I request specifically this object. The server complies, gives me the object, closes the connection, and then the information is displayed on the screen. And that's just a, the, that's a, a non-persistent HTML, right? So what, hap what is the difference between this and persistent? Is that you don't have the closed connection. It continues, right? So then what happens is the client says, I want another object. And then all this, so basically what I would do is I would then send another request message saying, now I need this object. OK, here you go. And then what happens is it continues on until there is an explicit uh, request to close the connection. So there's two techniques in HTTP. Again, you might have seen this in Wireshark, OK? There's post and there's get. So post, is, what happens is your web page, OK? So it has its a form element. So what happens is this is when you upload to the server in an HTTP body. And get, on the other hand, is you upload the URL field request and you, you, obtain, and you get the HTTP message, such as in this case, if any of you use Exchange Mail, you would have something along these lines. Okay. So what happens is you have several versions of HTTP. So you have HTTP 1.0 and 1.1. And what you get is you have you know, the post and get. And you also have something called head. And what the head does is it asks the server um, to leave the request object out, uh, out of response. Okay? So no message in the body. So just, give me, just, just, just leave out the, you know, um, the, the object out of the response. And so what it does is, is to test the hyperlink for validity. So is, is this legit or is it like bogus? right? So there's really no information that's being conducted here. On the other hand, in 1.1, you have all these three. So you have post, you have get, you have head, which again, is, it's, it's checking the link, but it's not getting actual information. Just says, it, is it valid? And then you also have put and delete. So put means you upload files in the entity body to that path, the URL path. And delete, it deletes those fields in the URL field. Okay. So what, now what we've got in 1.1 is we have these five, five uh, types of um, access, if you will, between server and client. Whereas in 1.0, we only have three. Okay. And then finally, in HTTP response status codes. So there are a few. Okay. So you probably have seen these. I'm trying to think, which one is it? Is it MIT? Let's see. I'm wondering if, I'm just kind of cu uh, curious. Do, 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 do. It might not, n they might have changed it. Uh, so let's say we put garbage, da la la la. Ah. Okay, let's try the, e the ECE website. Actually, you know, it's uh, EECS. Do, 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 do. Uh, they got so boring. OK. So what happens is many, many moons ago, I think, uh, again, 95, 95-ish. So when they had their website and you entered something incorrect, so like a 404, um, they had this cute little thing about something about your website was, like, I don't know, it tasted good, I ate it, ha, 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 404, uh, you know, something whimsical. <laughs> but have any of you have seen? Actually, we just saw it. So let's, let's say we go to... Uh, Let's go to my, my website. So if you do this and slash tilde Alex Blue. So you get that. Ooh, hiker Alex. And then blah 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 blah. Object not found, code 404. So what happens is there are certain types of error codes that these um, you know web servers will actually spit out. 404 usually comes up when it's not found. You entered a URL, so you had the URL, you have the host name, and then you give a path, but the path doesn't exist. What sort of feedback do you deliver to the person, to the client, trying to access that information? So 404 is that famous one, like, um, 
I'm trying to think. How many of you, no, I'm not going to ask that. Maybe offline afterwards. But there was a cartoon that made fun of this. I think uh, the, the person who did the voice, because it, it, I'll try and do my best. It's like, for a Ford, you know? So basically, what for a four means, it ain't there. You also have a variety of other types of codes. So you have 200, which means everything's kosher. Everything's good. And then 301 means it's moved permanently. So your object essentially went to another location. You have bad requests. And then finally, 505, which means that your HTTP version is not supported. Right? So like whatever client you're using does, is not compatible with whatever server is uh, handling it. So, but 404, I think a lot of people are, are, are aware of. All right. So, so what did we see in this lecture? So really, I kind of zipped through it. But for the most part, this is a type of application I think almost all of us use day to day. Like for some of us, like Linux users who often need to use Exchange Mail, and there's not really a great Linux client for using Exchange Mails of any sort, what ends up happening, you're like restricted to using uh, web, web clients and such. So, but in general, we all take this for granted, right? With our phones, with our laptops, with whatever. And the understanding that, you know, there, there is a pro protocol involved where we have client, we have server, we have error codes, we have various commands about getting information <coughs> and as well as giving information back and as well as to stop a process of persistent and non-persistent um, connections. I think what, what this does is it's very simple, but since then things have really expanded. But at least as a starting point, it's good to know that um, you know, there, there is sort of a logical foundation for all of this. And what we've learned in the last 26 lectures uh, built up to this moment is essentially like this application we should not take for granted. Because what happens with port 80? What happens with like, you know, transport layers and IP layers? Like, you know, something as simple as accessing CNN you know, is a lot more complicated when you look down through all the way through the communication stack to the communication network and then the other end. So with that, uh, this is lecture 27. And stay tuned for lecture 28 tomorrow when we look at DNS. And that'll, that'll wrap up this course. OK, that is lecture 27. Good night.